Good morning. Welcome to this event at Hudson Institute. My name is Rebecca Heinrichs. I'm a senior fellow here, and I'm the director of our Keystone Defense Initiative. Today, I have the pleasure of, of having a conversation with two, um, two authors who have just written, um, I think, a timely and critically important book um, for the country called Kabul, The Untold Story of Biden's Fiasco and the American Warriors Who Fought to the End. Um, and so thank you all for being here with us today as we uh, talk about the contents of the book, how it's being received, and some of the important things that we should uh, take away from the book. First, let me introduce our great authors here. It's a pleasure to have them here with us today. Jerry Dunleavy is a journalist, investigator. Um, he's helping uh, currently to lead the House Foreign Affairs Committee's investigation into the Afghanistan withdrawal. He previously worked as an investigative reporter for the Washington Examiner. He has published numerous groundbreaking stories of national importance, ranging from China's COVID, COVID cover-up um, the, and the breakout of COVID-19 in Wuhan to the FBI's atrocious mishandling of the Trump-Russia investigation. He frequently appears for in-depth discussions on Fox News and C-SPAN. And James Hassan is a former Army captain, graduate of U.S. Army Ranger School, an Afghanistan veteran who received the Bronze Star. He is deeply embedded in the active duty military and veteran communities and assisted in the veteran-led evacuation efforts of Afghan allies and American citizens in August 2021 would love to talk about that too. Yeah. I know that that was something, I think there's a whole nother book to be written about the, the efforts of so many people um, across the country, but really in the Washington DC area who pulled contacts to try to do whatever we could um, during the, the withdrawal to, to get those um, deserving worthy people out safely. Um, and and there's, there's so much work that was done, especially among the veteran community. Yeah. Uh not to interrupt, but it was the American people at their very best, and yeah. uh, the American government at its very worst. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, he, uh, James, has published articles on military and foreign policy issues in the New York Post, Washington Examiner, and other publications. We are uh, privileged to have them with us today. So I want to start off by uh, uh, talking about what motivated you to write the book, and then your methodology. How did you approach it? What were the questions you were after, after? Who did you talk to? And the kinds of things that you pursued to get the information? Jerry? Well, look, in, in the summer of 2021, I was technically a Justice Department reporter. But I, I, I told my outlet, you know, that things are going south in Afghanistan. And we have, we have, to, we have to write about this, because this, this is going to get bad. And it's going to get bad quickly. So I, you know, as a reporter, I then spent months basically focused on the Taliban takeover, the fall of Kabul, the disastrous evacuation, and then all of the Americans and Afghan allies that we left behind. Um, and so look, I've, I've been, it seems cliche, but I'm a, you know, I was 13 when 9-11 uh, happened. Um, and so I took this uh, war personally, um, and having the Taliban back in charge on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, um, look, it was, a, it was a strategic failure. We, we lost this war, and um, the way that we lost it was a choice. Um, and so I felt motivated to continue to report on it, and luckily I had a great friend in James who um, was also very passionate about this as well, having served there and having many friends who served there. And so we said, especially as the brief media focus on the disaster dissipated, um, we said a book needs to be written about this. Yeah. Um, and so we did. Yeah, and, and the way that uh, we went about it uh, was I, you know, I knew a lot of people who were still there. Um, I knew some people who were on the ground in Kabul. Um, and you know, as Jerry mentioned, as, as things were sort of leading up to the withdrawal, um, I was talking to people who were on the ground who were saying, you know, the lights are flashing red. Um, and um, I was able to kind of, you know, leverage that. And in the way that we went about writing the book was to be as, as factual as possible. Uh, if this had been any other administration, we would have written the same book. And so we ended up um, talking to uh, hundreds of people from, you know, the, the 
18, 19 year old Marines and soldiers at the gates um, to you know, special forces operatives who are you know, a gentleman who was the uh, uh, chief of staff for um, Special Operations Command Central during the whole investigation um, to say nothing of everyone else and then read through uh, literally tens of thousands of pages of Pentagon documents um, through, you know, made available through FOIA and, and, and otherwise. Um, no, that, that's really helpful. And, and so let's talk about some of the things that you uncovered then. Let's, be, let's begin by, um, for those of you who are following on, online at home or who have the books, on page uh, 55, um, it, it begins to outline what we knew about how much control the Taliban had of the territory at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and you say here that the, the, the Taliban controlled 88 districts by May 25, 106 by June 14th. And this was not what Mark Milley said. By, uh, by July 15th, it controlled 221. It was assessed that Afghanistan, quote, is at risk of complete collapse if the government and military do not get a handle on the security situation quickly. But this was not the assessment of Mark Milley. So talk about what you found out about what the US government understood, but then how it was communicated, and what were the um, considerations that were, that were being made that were erroneous or just simply not accurate, either of you? Want to take well, that one? I'll, Go first. I'll, I'll, I'll start. So it was very clear um, when President Biden made his total withdrawal announcement in April 2021, um, he was warned by all the military generals that if you pull all US troops in rapid fashion, um, without a plan, by the way, about how to get Americans out, certainly without a plan about how to get the tens of thousands of Afghan allies out that we had made promises to. Um, if you do that, if you pull those US troops in rapid fashion without that plan, without a plan about how to continue to support the Afghan military, which was a very weak and shaky military already, we had built the Afghan military to revolve around and rely upon US military support. And pulling all of our troops in rapid fashion also meant pulling contractors, logistics, ISR, everything that the Afghan military relied upon. Biden was warned that if you do that, this will collapse in rapid fashion. So who was he warned by? Because then we had, we had this difference of opinion. We had mm -hmm. a different view between the commanders sort of on the ground who could assess what was going on. But then you had Mark Milley testifying before Congress the Taliban controlled just 81 of the 419 districts. So did you see a, a, a disunity among the brass? Uh, when, it, when it came to the actual withdrawal itself, uh, believe it or not, no. But when it came to uh, public statements and, and uh, what people were willing to put on the line, you know, as you mentioned, in Congress versus repeating mm -hmm. the, you know, the party line, uh, there was uh, you know, a little bit of a, a dissonance between the people at the very top you know, people like General Milley and, uh, you know, people who, who maybe didn't have that platform in Congress. One person I would highlight is General Scotty Miller, who's a, you know, famed Delta operator and um, was, was in command of U.S. forces Afghanistan at the time. And, uh, you know, everyone says, oh, he retired early. Well, he actually resigned because he didn't want to, because he, he couldn't execute what, what, was, uh, what he was being asked to execute. So I think he, he's one of the very few um, that, that really did things correctly. But uh, it, you know, it wasn't just the Taliban's takeover, but it was also the strength of the Afghan military that was being fudged. Um, you know, General Milley at one point testified that the Afghan military was 325,000 strong. And the, uh, you know, the administration repeated this line over and over, uh, President Biden himself. And that was, that was a complete fiction for several reasons. Uh, first, it counted local police and border patrol units as part of the military. And you know, we wouldn't say here that the US military is 10 million strong because we're counting the police force in Peoria, Illinois. Um, and, and that's kind of how they're playing shell games. But second, there was a very well-known problem of what are called ghost units. They were Afghan military units that existed only on paper. Uh, and there were ways for basically corruption avenues for Afghan, senior Afghan leaders to collect you know, salaries for these non-existent units. And that was a well-known problem. Uh, we, we documented it all in Kabul. Um, and it was, it was widely known at the time. So those numbers were inflated that way. And third, they continued to repeat it even as the actual Afghan military units were taking severe casualties and there were desertions 
documented completely throughout spring and early summer. And why this is important is that the, the U.S. military's, not, not the U.S. military, but the U.S. government's strategy, such as it was, if you can call it that, relied upon the Afghan military continuing to fight the Taliban, even as we pulled all of our troops out. Because our plan, the U.S. government's plan, the Biden administration's plan, was to keep an embassy functioning, keep the Kabul airport functioning, even as we pulled all of our troops out. And so this 300,000 troop figure was key to selling this idea to the American public, to the Afghans, to the world, that you know you can rely on this 300,000 strong Afghan military. And it, it, it was a fiction, and it was known to be a fiction at the time. And to go to, to your point about you know, the, the Taliban taking over, the US government, in public statements, was always way behind on what the reality on the ground was of the Taliban's rapid takeover versus what we were saying publicly. And you had groups like the Long War Journal who were tracking the Taliban taking over district after district after district, but people like Chairman Milley testifying, he was weeks behind mm -hmm. where, where the Taliban actually was. And so by the, by the summer of 2021, the Taliban had, had taken over massive numbers of districts, had surrounded provincial capitals, but the U.S. government was behind. And I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that the U.S. government would be behind you know, groups that were doing a lot of open source stuff about what right. the Taliban was doing. One, one thing very quickly I just want to emphasize is not that we didn't know, because we did. Um, and one thing that we, we revealed in Kabul is that uh, the CIA's assessment was that uh, the Afghan military would survive a max 90 days and a minimum of 30. So there was disunity among intelligence agencies. Maybe that was different than what, Defense Intelligence Agency versus CIA? Or, or whatever it was, there was, there was a lag with what, what was being publicly um, talked about by the Foundation for Defense of Democracy's publication, The Long War Journal. Yeah, there was serious dissonance actually within the, the US government. So the, the, the State Department had a much rosier picture about Afghanistan's long-term survival without US troops, uh, you know, sometimes projecting years, whereas uh, the Defense Department was much more circumspect about that, um, thinking that you know you had uh, uh, General um, Miller, that, who James had mentioned earlier, who was predicting you know the total Taliban takeover and Afghan government collapse perhaps by October, um, November, December, you know Thanksgiving, Christmas time period, which was and and you had elements of the intelligence community who were you know even warning more dire than that. So there was dissonance within the, the US government, but among the intelligence community and the Defense Department, everybody knew that the Taliban would be taking over very quickly. And it's clear that the US government, the Biden administration, did not have a plan in place to deal with it. Even if it hadn't happened August 15th, they weren't ready. Well, let's, let's go in before, I wanna move um, from this very important topic, but just before I do that, because we, we've talked about, I think sort of famously, the way the, the narrative was and the unfolding of the withdrawal was that the, the Afghan military was you know, unwilling to stand up for itself. It was not courageous. It didn't want to defend its own country. You know, that is, and I think in, in some, a lot of it was corrupt. It just wasn't able without the, but, but then, as you point out, what we didn't, they didn't have American ISR, they didn't have that support. So as the United States began to pull out, some of these guys understood that they didn't stand a chance. But I did want to um, point out one, one, one issue that you, you brought up I thought was really important. On, again, on page um, 57, Colonel Sarab Azimi was a well-regarded US-trained Afghan Special Forces field commander. And he was killed, along with 22 of his men, by the Taliban. And this was whenever, at this point, the Afghan military was essentially relying on these special forces. So mm -hmm. this was another big inflection point where we could see that things were going disastrously. And so as the Taliban made significant gains and Afghan forces folded, the Afghan military was increasingly relying on these special forces. And so his death was another big turning point, not just in terms of actual capability, but the morale of yep. US Afghan forces. Yeah, well, look, Afghan you know, forces. the the... The, the Afghan military ultimately did collapse and dissolve, but the idea that 
no, no Afghans were fighting in 2021. I mean, it's just simply not true. It, the Afghan military took thousands and thousands of casualties in, in, in 2021 as the Taliban took over. And as we lay out in the book, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the Afghan military was relying on U.S. support. And so as U.S. support was pulled, it meant uh, the Afghan, you know, Afghan uh, Air Force Sorry. was largely collapsing and being grounded. Afghan special forces were being relied on much more heavily. But as the Taliban took over, the Afghan reliance on Afghan special forces had to increase. But it, it just wasn't a sustainable uh, thing. So page uh, 185 um, gets into the Abbey Gate tragedy and the bombing around Abbey Gate. And so, James, I want you to kind of walk us through this. I thought that this, this was an incredibly poignant point. Um, the Abbey Gate bombing was the third deadliest day for U.S. forces during the entire two-decade war. So talk about Abbey Gate, and then if I'm not mistaken, this this uh, some of the the facts that you that you uh, bring forward uh, here was misreported or wasn't reported. There were some mistakes a little bit in in a report I think by one of the networks. If you want to correct that sure, and just kind sure. of lay lay it out for us here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, it was the third deadliest uh, day for Americans in the whole 20 year war. Uh, there was an ISIS case suicide bomber outside of Abbey Gate, which was the main entrance point for uh, you know, Afghans trying to get in, but also Americans trying to get in. Um, and, and we do know there are actually Americans, citizens, civilians, who are the, kind of the back of the crowd who just managed to not be killed or hurt by, by the bombing. Um, so there, there could have been even more loss of American life. But one of the things that, that we pointed out um, and that, that we um, you know, reported in the Pentagon's own words uh, coming through sworn statements from um, senior uh, military officers on the ground, and also um, transcribed interviews with the um, with you know, soldiers and Marines of all ranks, but especially those making decisions, uh, was that uh, you know we, we knew that an attack was coming, and, and I think that's that in itself is pretty uncontroversial, given that uh, you had President Biden, uh, you know, warning about an ISIS attack mm -hmm. coming days beforehand. You even had President Macron reporting that. Um, so in the days leading up, uh, everybody, everybody kind of knew that there was this threat. But it's also important to walk back a little bit. Um, so one of the consequences of the decision to give up Bagram against all military advice was that there was an ISIS-K terrorist, soon to be suicide bomber, in prison um, at Bagram. And when we abandoned it and the Taliban overran it, uh, this man, whose name is Abdul Rahman al um was freed. and. Um, he had been captured by the CIA in 2019 for trying to conduct a different suicide attack. And he immediately made his way uh, you know, back into the action. And uh, they, uh, there were, we make the case that the attack was not, um, quote, unpreventable, which is what the, the Biden administration has continued to rely on. And I think it's, it's obviously was preventable if we had just held Bagram, this gentleman would have been, not gentleman, this guy would have been behind bars mm -hmm. uh, versus wearing a suicide vest outside the gate. Uh, but secondly, there, there were two different uh, types of opportunities that, that we had that if we had not decided to rely on the Taliban for our security, um, could have possibly disrupted um, this attack. And the first is that uh, you know, we reported that the um, the military asked the Taliban to raid known and suspected ISIS-K locations in the days leading up to the bombing. Um, one of those was a, a hotel um, about two to three kilometers west of the airfield. And the Taliban oftentimes um, just said no, uh, which, of course, is, is totally inconsistent with the administration's uh, public statements that the Taliban was businesslike and professional and our security partners throughout this whole thing. Um, and in fact, uh, General McKenzie uh, confirmed now that there were at least, after a book came out, uh, that was kind of the first that it was ever reported, then he, he confirmed that there were at least 10 of these instances, well, more than 10. More than 10 times in the days leading up to the attack, we asked the Taliban um, to, to raid or, or search ISIS-K 
locations. So just to be clear on that, we were outsourcing anti-ISIS operations in Kabul, in Kabul uh, while we were withdrawing U.S. forces, and there were limitations on U.S. forces being able to act affirmatively in their own self-defense, yeah, um, or at least proactively in their own self-defense. Uh, and, and so that was, that's, that's one. And separately, uh, we, uh, based on sworn statements from, um, among other people, a, a senior military officer who was the sole targeting, not the sole, but a targeting authority in Afghanistan until August 15th, uh, who personally approved 51 different airstrikes from July up to August 15th, based on his sworn statement to Pentagon investigators. Uh, there was a, a strike package, um, a targeting package, an airstrike, proposed airstrike, um, drawn up for an ISIS-K location in Nangarhar province, which is right on the border um, of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, but it, it is, it's ISIS-K's um, hotbed, it's their, their central hub of operations. And uh, the person to be targeted was a, a man named Kabir Aidi, who was a, um, a suicide attack facilitator and an attack planner, among other things. And that, um, that attack was deemed infeasible um, due to uh, potential negative response from the Taliban. Hmm. And, but what's crucial about this is that we ended up executing what appears to be that exact same targeting package that exact same airstrike, proposed airstrike, on August 27th, the day after the attack, and, and killed this individual. And the government at the time said, yes, he was involved in the August 26th attack. And in fact, government officials said, we killed him to prevent a follow-on attack. So it stands to reason that if by killing him on the 27th, potentially, or according to the military, disrupted a follow-on attack, uh, potentially killing him on the 24th, uh, could have, could have disrupted that attack as well. And uh, I, I believe when uh, Jennifer Griffin at Fox News interviewed General McKenzie, she conflated the two and asked if there had ever been an airstrike on a Kabul hotel planned. And that, that, that was never something that we reported or anyone else did. So with respect to General McKenzie, uh, he denied something that no one's ever claimed. But, but the two things, those two things are, are, are rock solid. What about the sniper's and, testimony? Just yeah, a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll take questions in, in just a moment, sir. So then, so the so General McKenzie's comments publicly have still has have not undermined anything that you've uncovered. In not your, not in the book. least. In, in fact, yeah, he was the first person to confirm publicly what we reported about the military asking the Taliban to to raid ISIS K locations. So if anything, he actually confirmed, uh, you know. The first half of what I just told you, and the second half, nobody's ever been asked, but it's it's literally in black and white um, in the Pentagon's own report. Um, any any well, I could spend a lot more time even just talking about Bagram and the decisions that went into. Um, it was really a, it was a it was political leaders that made the decision not to go with Bagram, right? It wasn't it, there was military best advice given for different options, mm -hmm. um, understanding that they had constraints because of how many troops they were allowed to have in country to conduct the withdrawal. But the decision was made to not go with Bagram, not to maintain and keep Bagram, but but to go to the airport. Yeah. You want yeah. to talk about some of the facts surrounding I mean, that? I mean, look, you know, the the abandonment, uh, the U.S. abandonment of Bagram was sort of, I, I think, perhaps the the death knell of the Afghan Republic because we Bagram was important for many reasons, and giving it up was very foolish for many reasons. It, it was would have been a much safer place to do an eva an evacuation from a non combatant evacuation operation or a neo from. Um, the choices basically to do a NEO would, were Kabul Airport, which is in the middle of Kabul, city of millions of people, or to do a NEO through Bagram Air Base, which was a very large, strategically placed, extremely defensible base. If we had done the NEO through Bagram, you never would have seen the chaos that you saw there um, in, in Kabul and at, at uh, Hamid Kaza Air National Airport. On top of that, as James mentioned, Bagram held a number of prisons there that inside those prisons were thousands, about 2,000 ISIS-K terrorists, dozens of Al-Qaeda terrorists, thousands of Taliban fighters. And the first thing that the Taliban did when they took over Bagram was free all of those people back out onto the battlefield. Thousands of ISIS-K terrorists back out onto the battlefield, 
including, as James mentioned, the suicide bomber who would then uh, just about a week and a half later go and kill those 13 Americans at Abbey Gate. On top of that, Bagram was you know, a place for us to project our power. It would have been much more difficult for the Taliban to just roll into Kabul and knock on the door if we had maintained a presence at, at Bagram. And it would have been helpful for us to also continue to support the Afghan military out of Bagram. So closing Bagram was foolish for many reasons, but it was a political decision. It was a decision driven by President Biden's desire to get U.S. troop level, U.S. troop numbers down to an extremely low level. And it just, with the, with the number games that we were doing, it just became impossible, it looks like, to hold both Bagram and to maintain the troop presence necessary to guard the embassy and the airfield because of this idea that the Biden administration had to somehow keep an embassy and an airport functioning even as the Taliban you know, took over the country. And to be very, kind of to put fine numbers on that, uh, the military told uh, the White House that ideally they'd have 3,500 people to hold Bagram. They said we can do it with 2,200. Uh, President Biden wanted no more than 600 troops in the country and you just can't hold Bagram with 600 troops. Um, and, and in fact, that the decision was made almost so abruptly that we talked to um, uh, Army, senior Army non-commissioned officers who were installing sensitive equipment at Bagram days before the order came to withdraw it, and they had to go back and rip it all out. Um, and, and so that, that's how just ill thought out the whole thing was. And, and quickly. In and terms quickly. of the timeline, it, it was not well thought out, but but then seems to bolster the viewpoint that it's not an unfair sort of partisan motivation to just make the, the observation mm-hmm. that this was, a, this was a White House decision not uh, developed based on assessments of what was actually going on at Bagram um, and what kind of work was already, was already ongoing. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the facts don't become partisan just because they, they make someone look bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, the facts are what they are. And it, it's undeniable that this decision came from the White House, and it's undeniable that it led to death. And, and that's just all there is to it. Um, so um, so how many, if I could just, we, how many troops then were, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, I'm calling numbers, but just so I can kind of have an idea. You said it was about, he, the president wanted only 600 troops in if, during the withdrawal or just um, in conclusion. At what point were that 600 requirement? Uh, that, that was triggered in the months leading up, in the, basically the last month leading up to okay. once we closed Bagram and collapsed back to Kabul, we had 600. And so the weight to... of that entire withdrawal, what we saw as Americans unfolding on, on television, was about 600 Americans conducting they, they, the operation. They rushed 5,000 back in. But that's one of the reasons why the airport got flooded with people falling off planes is because, I mean, we didn't even have enough people to hold the entire airport. We were relying still on the Afghan military to do half of it, too. But we started with 600, yeah. rushed in 5,000. Yes. yes. OK. Um, uh, let, let's move on before I, so then I can move to questions um, from the audience, because I think that this is, uh, I know, I think you might have started to go there, and I would appreciate that you held fire, because <laughs> um, I want to spend some time talking about this. Um, page 283, for those following along at home here, um, I, I, a lot of the work that I do here at Hudson Institute is, my area of focus is specifically looking at the global chess board. Um, and I don't do anti-terrorism specifically. I'm looking at how do we deter and then win if deterrence fails against major power war. That's my area of, of focus. But my, my interest in what was going on in Afghanistan in particular as it related to my work was the impact that it had on assessments of our allies. Afghanistan was a NATO operation. And so the, the assessment and, the, and how this impacted our allies' perception of what the United States was doing regionally and globally, but then also the assessments that our adversaries were making about the United States and our commitment to the region, but then also just our commitment globally to forward, um, uh, being forward leading in, in what we had committed to. So um, Dragon Bear is, is this great subtitle you have here. Um, page 283, where you talk about um, uh, the, the assessments of this Russia-China 
uh, collaboration was ongoing in both of these two countries, which I've said is this is the axis, China being number one, Russia being its junior partner, both top tier strategic adversaries of the United mm -hmm. States. Jerry, I'm gonna turn it to you. What were some of the uh, some of the background things that were kind of moving going on with the Russians in particular as they watched this unfold in yeah. Afghanistan? Yeah. So we we have two chapters in our book just devoted to Russia's response to this and China's response to this. So with the Russians in 2021, the the Russians kind of began Biden's presidency in early 2021 with a buildup, getting close to 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border. Actually, people kind of forget this, but this is how they started out Biden's presidency. So at the time that President Biden was making his decision about whether to withdraw from Afghanistan, Russia was beginning its first buildup of, of troops there. Um, when President Biden made his announcement to withdraw from Afghanistan around that same time, the Russians pulled back as well. And in my view, they probably did that to kind of await and see, see what happens here. Um, and when the Taliban rapidly took over, um, August 15th, the Taliban is now back in charge. The Russians celebrated, of course, and they immediately adopted this as their new sort of, I think, lead up to wartime, but propaganda against the Ukrainians, basically saying, look, the, look at what happened in Afghanistan. This is what's going to happen to you. The United States is going, you know, is not going to be there and this is what happens when you ally with the United States and rely on the United States. This was the, the Russian propaganda. And you know, during 2021, I think the Russians were looking for indications to do what Putin has, I think, always wanted to do, which is a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And so uh, you had President Biden reversing or refusing to enforce sanctions against Nord Stream 2, which I think Putin took serious signals from that. And it certainly worried the Ukrainians and folks like the Poles um, when Nord Stream began to uh, move forward again. But Putin took, I think, the debacle in Afghanistan as sort of the sign that I think he was looking for. NATO was in disarray. Um, our, our exit was a bit of a debacle. And it looked like the US-NATO alliance was in a bit of a shambles. And so with the fall of Afghanistan, you immediately saw the Russian troop buildup again begin uh, in that late summer, early fall, continue and end in invasion. And there are, a, 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 you know, there are people who were in the, uh, who were witnesses in uh, the uh, Ukraine impeachment trial against uh, former President Trump, people like Fiona Hill and Kurt Volker, who say, yeah, Putin took that debacle in Afghanistan as the sign that he was looking for to finally move forward with this invasion. And uh, you even had the, the head of US uh, European Command um, assess that uh, Putin probably took that as a signal to uh, that this might be his, his time to invade as well. Uh, yeah, and just to add one more, one more thing to that, uh, the, um, we interviewed the um, former station chief, CIA station chief uh, in Moscow, who's, who's recently retired and, and you know, he, he told us essentially you can draw a direct line from, from Kabul to Kyiv. Uh, so I want to emphasize this is not kind of our conjecture. It, it's just this is, these are intelligence community assessments. These are you know, professional assessments. And um, you can see Russian propaganda saying kind of this is what's going to happen right afterwards. You can see the buildup. Um, and, and the reason why is because if we weren't even willing to project force to protect our own citizens, you know, how, how, less, how much less likely would we be to, to you know, prop up any allies and, and you know, kind of like the, the Afghan well, and allies? Then, and I would say just to, and from my own work, the, again, the operation there was a NATO effort. So it wasn't even, it's not even just this sort of like, you know, very theoretical lack, right. a, a perception of a US lack of commitment to NATO. I mean. President Biden sort of famously wasn't even picking up the phone when you had Boris Johnson right. of the UK trying to get a hold of him to figure out what was going on. And that operation there was, that NATO effort was not only supporting Afghan forces, it was conducting counterterrorism operations. Yeah. And so, um, and then, so I do before, I would, I would hate to miss this, in terms of what we, we were promised when this was going on, that we would still have an over the horizon capability for NATO to still have eyes on what's going, but now you can see that they're, you know, uh, 
other counterterrorism efforts like moved to Africa, moved to Niger, but where that is collapsing now too. So the United States is not going to have a strong foothold mm -hmm. there to conduct counterterrorism operations. So just if you could, just in terms of NATO's ability to to know where these ISIS, Hafez, Al Qaeda, um, uh, what, what what is the status now of Afghanistan? Are eyes in there and our ability to kind of see what's going on? Yeah, it's well, a it's it's incredibly degraded, um, and for for one, there are Al Qaeda, basically card carrying Al Qaeda members who are part of the Taliban government now. So the you know, President Biden's statement that they're gone is uh, belied by reality, but. We have very limited intelligence there. We, we did have the successful strike against Ayman al Zawahiri, who was the um, Al Qaeda leader at the time, who, lo and behold, moved back to Kabul and was living in um, a guest house of a, a senior Haqqani and Taliban figure at the time. But um, there was a, a, a very severe lack of intelligence, but also on the flip side, uh, a greater counterintelligence threat for us because Iran. Russia, but also especially Iran, spent a whole lot of time recruiting and debriefing Afghan commandos that served alongside US special operations troops for decades, finding out things like what our capabilities are, how we plan for missions, how we react to things. Um, and it was publicly reported that um, Wagner, or Wagner uh, was recruiting um, former Afghan commandos. And that's one thing that we confirmed in the book. Uh, you know, and. Uh, and we were able to actually um, get that you know, directly from Afghan commandos who were approached. So you could say that uh, in terms of like the IRGC in Iran, that this was a boon for them in terms of their ability to learn how the United States was conducting counterterrorism operations inside Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And so people focus on the weapons, but there's a huge uh, you know, personnel issue too. And you can even see um, senior former Afghan commandos um, kids on social media, you know, with senior IRGC figures, believe it or not. There are literally social media pictures showing them hanging out together now, if that's not enough of a confirmation for you. Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, you can, if you want, I'm going to ask this, then you can answer, add to anything if you want there, Jerry. But I do want to talk then about China um, also, because um, China was, was watching this unfold too. Um, and, I, and I find it interesting because you know some of the pushback I get from some analysts is saying that you know the Afghanistan withdrawal, it actually freed the United States up to counter China and Russia. It, it, it didn't it didn't necessarily have this negative impact. But those same people will say, oh, but China's watching how we defend Ukraine for their calculations with Taiwan. Why in the world would Xi Jinping not be making some kind of assessments about U.S. willingness and? Um, commitment to its missions abroad, but but I, I don't want to leave the witness too much. I want you to, to tell us what you uncover, Jerry. Well, look, I mean that that is sort of a, a big argument, that, and the Biden administration has made this argument as well that leaving Afghanistan freed us up to deal with Russia and China. But you know, sort of the the problem with that, what the problem that they run into with that is sort of what we just discussed is that it, it is our ev evidence based you know conclusion that the debacle in Afghanistan is what finally, I think, was among the, the factors that encouraged Putin to launch his invasion of Ukraine. And now we are dealing with a massive war on the European continent. Um, and so, you know, did, did, did pulling those 2,500 troops out to, so that we can free up ourselves to uh, deal with Russia, was that worth it to now have to deal with a Russian invasion of Ukraine. I, I don't think that the, the, the balance works out there. And um, when it comes to China, um, look, China um, reacted sort of the same way that Russia did. This was a huge uh, propaganda uh, win for China. And the Chinese Communist Party continues uh, to use our debacle in Afghanistan as propaganda, specifically propaganda aimed at Taiwan. So when the Taliban took over Afghanistan on August 15th, uh, the Chinese Communist Party dubbed this the Kabul moment. Um, and they must have liked uh, that phrasing because just recently on the second anniversary of uh, the Taliban takeover of Kabul, the Chinese foreign ministry returned to its propaganda about the Kabul moment. So uh, Chinese Communist Party, Chinese state media, um, have all used this, again, to target Taiwan. 
in a similar way that the Russians targeted the Ukrainians in the lead up to their invasion of Ukraine, the Chinese have been targeting the the Taiwanese uh, saying, you cannot count on the United States. Look at what happened in Afghanistan. That's what's going to happen to you. And obviously, there there have been a number of reasons, I think, why China has ramped up its pressure on Taiwan um, since uh, August 2021. But one of those is, I think, this debacle in Afghanistan. And when it comes to Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, and when it comes to China and its increasing bellicosity against Taiwan, I don't think that anyone can deny that two years later, we do live in a more dangerous world than we were living in, in 2021. And, you know, the Taliban taking over Afghanistan after 20 years, um, the Taliban who were harbored al-Qaeda and not just harbored them, but refused to hand over Osama bin Laden after 9-11 and then fought alongside them for 20 years against American forces. Um, the Taliban being in charge on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, you know, that, that, was, a, that was a choice. Um, that was in part a choice uh, that, you know, that resulted from U.S. Uh, decision-making, specifically President Biden's decision to set 9-11 as the, as the withdrawal date. Um, so it's a strategic failure um, in Afghanistan, but unfortunately, that strategic failure in Afghanistan did not stay in Afghanistan. Um, because our adversaries are are watching and they're always looking to take advantage of things like this. And then I'm going to turn it over to questions maybe while you're thinking about this. Did, did losing Bagram, um, in, in, did, did you, was, it, was there any sort of consideration when, 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 we were, when our military force were thinking about Bagram, Bagram, that the strategic importance it would play versus China in terms of U.S. forces maintaining a presence there, one, to prevent, to kind of box out the Chinese from moving in there, um, but, but also just as a, a stable sort of forward presence right there. Is, did, that come ac- did that come across your research? Not at all. So we, we looked at a lot of the recommendations. We were privy to a lot of what was going on, and that never, that never came up. Uh, and Bagram was built by the Soviets. It, it's a strategically placed air base that can project power all around Southwest Asia, you know, and it's in a country that borders China. And we do know that China has designs on it. Um, and that was something that was just never once And so for, for an administration that defends its decision up to make this precipitous withdrawal, saying that its focus was for the pacing threat, China, never considered, to your knowledge, in your research, the strategic value of U.S. forces maintaining Bagram Air Force Base? Not at all. Not just as a deterrent. And it definitely didn't consider it as something that China could take over, which it's trying to do now. Okay, we've got time for just a couple. We'll go with you, sir. Anybody? Plus, uh, experience in Afghanistan, former congressman. Hey, Don. Um, I, I had interjected improperly uh, on, on the forgiven. issue of the sniper, and I, I'd like to just have you guys comment on that because Mackenzie denied that the chain of command denied the sniper uh, permission. That's a, just a quick question. Mm-hmm. How, did, how do you, you guys didn't mention the sniper? That yeah. was like on top of all the things mm-hmm. you've said. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Marine Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews testified to Congress earlier this year that he had, uh, who he believed to be uh, the sus- a, sus- uh, a suspicious individual, suspected potential suicide bomber in his sights, that he asked for permission to take. The uh, to take the shot, and that uh, permission was 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 never granted. Um, that remains, I think, a big unanswered question for the Pentagon. And what I'll note is that uh, CENTCOM uh, very recently announced that they are reopening this portion of their on a investigation um, in, in in based on what they said because of testimony from Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews and other revelations that, that have occurred. And I just want to add a, a brief note. You mentioned China and Bagram, so important, Xinjiang province, where they have their nuclear facilities. It's mm-hmm. 400 miles right up the Wakhan Peninsula. Mm-hmm. But in addition to that, there's Shindan, 75 miles from the Iranian border. Mm-hmm. And uh, these are multi, multi-billion dollar investments of US taxpayer money yeah. in the geostrategic realm that you're interested in. The geostrategic failure uh, 
it's a way above and beyond the uh, this initial loss of life and terrible things happening it is so great and it is completely uh, subjugated. The subject is, is absolutely denied in the White House. You're not allowed to even mention the word Afghanistan, the embarrassment of failure is so great. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you, sir. That was really well said. If you, I'm going to let you comment on that too real quick, but also Go if you it. can then in this, um, um, as you respond, the, the reception that you've had, because that has been a challenge at getting the, the president's team to turn over all of these things that you all worked really hard to get to. They, they, they have had a file that they have not wanted the Congress to be paying attention to, especially during this political season. Yeah. Um, so if you'd answer the yeah, yeah, yeah. questions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just, I think it's a great point. And I think it dovetails with what you just said in terms of the administration not wanting to even approach this issue, even though they say it's a success. It's also one of the reasons there's been no accountability because firing somebody like General, you know, Secretary Austin or Secretary Blinken implicitly admits that there was actually a mistake. Um, and yeah, the, the administration has been stonewalling. The, the sec, uh, Inspector General for Afghanistan said that this is the first administration that has not complied with his requests. Uh, we know that um, there was a dissent cable sent by the State Department to uh, Secretary Blinken in July 2021 warning that um, you know, everything was going to fall apart and that Blinken ignored it. Uh, the State Department refused to provide that to Congress for, for two years. We were able to report, and now Congress has it, um, we were able to uh, not only confirm that report, but um, one of the things we mentioned in Kabul is that the, the two principal authors of that dissent cable were actually Obama National Security Council alums, uh, which just, just underscores kind of the, the scope of the um, disaster. Well, um, I, I think uh, you've done all of us a great service by... Um, by doing the research and doing the heavy lifting to, to uncover this and, and piece together the story. Uh, we, we are very grateful. Um, the, the Afghan translators um, who risked everything um, to help uh, the United States mission there, many of whom were still left behind. Um, I think some of them maybe are still trying or they're in transition. Tens of thousands of them left behind. Tens of thousands. Um, uh, the um, so it's a strategic failure, tactical failure, operational um, mistakes that required very uh, haphazard responses or, or ad adaptations, but then also a, mor a moral failure. And, um, and then, of course, uh, must mention the, the American service members who paid the ultimate price uh, conducting um, the mission and, and doing an excellent and heroic job um, without everything that they really truly needed to be to be um, appropriately safe as they carried that out. So um, very thankful to you all. Um, and I encourage, oh, we have one last question from somebody who looks like he's got a really thoughtful question that I must ask. Go ahead. Well, guys, obviously, thanks for doing this. I recommend this book to everyone. So, so important. One of the points that you guys made in the book and that you've talked about subsequently is that with the exception of one statement in print uh, from the White House. Biden himself has never even said the names of the 13 Americans who were murdered in what you guys very clearly showed was a preventable attack. What do you make of this? Why, why does this seem to be so difficult? Thank you. So, you know, when writing the book, um, I, I had the real, the real honor and pleasure of talking to a lot of the Gold Star families of those 13 U.S. service members, and so I got to hear um, about their struggles and their stories and, and the ways that they are um, honoring their, their children um, and the sacrifices that their children made. Um, look, uh, I think we all remember the, the scene at the, the dignified transfer at, at, Dover, um, at Dover Air Base where President Biden kept looking at his watch um, and in his conversations with the, the family members, they, many of them brought up that, that he was, um, you know, br bringing up his, uh, the, the tragic uh, loss by, to cancer of his son, uh, uh, Bo Biden, um, but comparing that to, um, you know, the loss that they had just gone through like 48 hours before. Um, and so, 
uh, I, th I think that um, President Biden, uh, he hasn't said the names of the 13 out loud. I think for the same reason that um, he hasn't, he's, he and his administration have just wanted to move on because this was a, this was a failure um, start to finish. Uh, like James said, I would have written the same book um, if this happened under another president. Um, and uh, they just want to move on. Um, but the problem is, uh, you know, beyond I think that that being uh, a morally wrong thing to do um, and beyond just moving on, ignoring all the, the, the other members uh, of the military who served the HKI and the moral injury that they are dealing with. Um, moving on from Afghanistan, um, one takes our off the ball of terrorism emanating from that country, but two, um, allows us to make the same mistake again. Um, and uh, this was a, um, this was not just a failure in Afghanistan. This was not just 20 years of war and 20 years of sacrifice going down the drain, uh, you know, in one spring and one summer, pretty much. But we live in a more dangerous world now. And by making decisions in a haphazard sort of flipping way like we did in Afghanistan in 2021, if there's not accountability, uh, then it's very easy for people to make the same mistakes again. And we obviously can't afford that in a world where you have Russia invading another, you know, Ukraine and China getting ready to invade Taiwan. We can't afford to make mistakes. And so we can't afford to move on from Afghanistan without learning the lessons that we should. Yeah, only thing I'll, I'll add to that is that uh... We, you know, when we spoke to the families, they said that the, the president didn't know their, their children's names then either. Uh, and, uh, and so, as Jerry mentioned. Um, How many Silver Star families are out there with children involved in you? Uh, they, we know there are 45 um, that were, were wounded. There's uh, um, a female Marines paralyzed for life. Um, sorry, Tyler Vargas Andrews is, uh, you know. Uh, lost a few limbs, so there, and and there are, like Jerry said, uh, we, we we tell the stories of, of the men and women who are at the gates, um, in, in pretty graphic detail. Uh, that could be, at times, hard to read, but it's necessary to read. Uh, and so, even those who weren't uh, injured physically, I, I think, uh, you know, went through a whole lot and, and were injured in other ways as well. Well, our political leaders uh, might want to move on, but I'm very grateful that we are not moving on and that we are determined to uh, get to the bottom of this, learn the lessons of it, hold leaders accountable for the sake of uh, veterans who have served, for, the, for those who are still struggling, not just with physical injury, but with moral injury from um, the, the lack of leadership um, from our political leaders. And so incredibly thankful to the work that you've done, to your military service, to this country. Um, please join me in, in thanking our authors.